and later on in the workshop George Bars will also give you a little um, information on um, how important it is for you to know the habitat you're in and also ethics but the first category is um, growing your own herbs but before we go into that I, I just need to give you guys a shout out and introduce you to my teachers Sandy Jo Bailey um, is a herbalist how many years have you been a herbalist about 15 15 <coughs> at least and Sandy and Marty mm -hmm. <coughs> about 10 <coughs> and you can probably guess they're going to be covering what you need to <laughs> to go out into the field with and then Connie you've been uh, doing 10 12 13 somewhere in there so I was introduced to Tom Tracy of Swan Valley Herbs back in 2012 and what that did was that reignited uh, my herbalist desire, the passion I had 30 years ago when I homeschooled. Then life, you know, uh, of course we all, the trajectory changed. So I basically camped on the doorstep of Tom's shop and these guys uh, all these my friends they really took me under their wing and just helped keep that spark going and taught me a lot about wild crafting and how to make herbal so but we're all here today because we know that we have something within us that desires to take uh, control or be more independent with our health so growing our own herbals is one of the first areas that we can uh, begin that path. <coughs> so if you look at your handout, you'll see that uh, the first section is you're already growing some of these herbs that you use for cooking. Did you know how medicinal they really are? And um, what you'll find here, how I did this is at the end of each line there's the name of the book that I referenced so when it comes to growing your own nutrients or your own herbals I'm going to give a shout out to this book because what you see here on the table is just a, a, a small percentage of the library that each one of us has so while I was preparing this today for you I found myself going to this book more than any other book. So um, you can find this on Amazon, it just came out. In fact, um, Linda, the author, Linda Peterson, was going to be here at one o'clock, but um, she wasn't able to come up for Polson because of the weather. So uh, we have Herbs 101 in Polson at the library once a month. Herbs 101 at the library once group. a month, excellent. Um, on Amazon you can find her book I, I can't say enough about this book it's packed full of information and it's an easy book to use as a reference guide so in here uh, is where I found out how that basil is antibacterial antifungal and an antioxidant I had an idea that it was an antioxidant but I didn't realize that it was antibacterial or antifungal so um, I'm going to be growing more basil, definitely. Calendula is uh, an herb that I had only known to be good for skin until I was working over at Swan Valley Herbs and I was having excruciating stomach pains and I was given capsules of the powdered calendula. Well, guess what? Calendula is good for ulcers. I didn't necessarily have an ulcer, but whatever was going on in the imbalance in my stomach, the calendula within an hour dissipated and it never came back. So that's the benefit of growing calendula. Cilantro, um, how many are already growing cilantro? Um, it's become a more common knowledge that it is good for um, chelating out heavy metals out of the body and toxins. People either love cilantro or they cannot stand the flavor. So <laughs> I love cilantro. That's one though. I'm because time is so short, I'm only going to be covering just a few of the herbs in each category. But of course garlic is without saying um, it's how I vet my friends. 
<laughs> I think it's a positive. Yeah. I'm going to jump in to um, growing the annual herbs that are less commonly known. The first one that you see is Andrographis. Even though it's a longer maturing plant, I did include it because some of you have planting or gardening environments where you can extend the season. And it's so important for um, digestive and also for expelling parasites. Now at the end of that list, you see where I wrote uh, Strictly Medicinal Seeds. Some of you may know that company as Horizon Herbs. They're down in southwestern Oregon. Um, I would recommend if you have access to the internet to tap into them. They have just a cornucopia of seeds that they specialize in. Astragalus came to my knowledge a few years ago when um, my husband, he uh, just retired, shout out to George Bars. Um, October 1st, he had 50 years as a wildlife biologist and a forester. So he spent, I mean, he spent his life in the field, but this was one of the rare times that he got bit by a tick. And because I had just been um, introduced to these, my herbal friends, I was aware of Lyme's disease being a problem and the herbs can help that. So I went online. That's where I found Stephen Buner. Astragalus. At the end of the Astragalus line where it says, uh, see Stephen here at Buner's healing lines. Go online and find him. He has many books, but he is the nation's foremost expert on Lyme's protocol. So because being able to access that information, I was able to um, put George on a 30-day proactive protocol of astragalus. But astragalus is good for so many things. Um, I would encourage you to tap into that book for learning about um, the importance of astragalus. Elecham Payne is new to my awareness, and I discovered it through this book. What I'm showing you today, these are, I don't go very many places without these books. Elecham Payne was introduced to me as being good for um, when you have the <coughs> flu, but it's also good for uh, cleansing the liver, and it's an anti-parasitic. Um, it's not only that, but it is a perennial. If you decide to not use it, you know, you can plant enough of them that you can enjoy it as a perennial for its beauty because the flower is like this big straw flower and it stays in bloom for so long. But I did put it in the annual section because during its second year, that's when you want to dig up the root to use it for medicine. So Ella Campaign, if you look on your handout at the end of that line that says see Tilgner's book this is Tilgner's book and this has fastly become my number one companion um, she teaches you how to how to make your own uh, tinctures she has charts in here of what percentage of plant how much plant to put in the jar how much alcohol for each plant because some herbalists just go well look, like here's an example if you take this jar right here, some herbalists just automatically use a line right here or here for every herb or root. And that's, that's okay if that's what they want to do. But what you'll find is the more herbal books that you read, each herbalist has their own theory or philosophy that they subscribe to or that they practice with. I appreciated Cheryl Tilgner's book here because she breaks it down into a very practical learning approach with each herb or root and it's very thorough. So a little plug on her book and that's for Ella Campaign. The next one I'm going to touch on is Lobelia. Many, are there many people here who are familiar with the medicinal value of lobelia? 
Well, if you go on YouTube, you can find over 300 lectures by Dr. John Christopher, who is one of the early 20th century herbalists, like one of the fathers of herbalism. And he, he says, if someone's got something wrong, just give them lobelia. <laughs> and he says, they'll, if they get too much, they'll vomit and they'll purge out what's not good for them. <laughs> I think we've kind of refined ourselves in the 21st century, but I don't have Dr. John Christopher's book here, but um, he's very good in his lectures on YouTube. He also shares his formulas and provides that um, old-fashioned eclectic base that really helps us understand herbalism as a practice. So at the bottom of the first page here you can see the references that I used and I also brought those books here. So after we're done here, if you want to look at those, I encourage you to take your phone and take pictures of the books. That's what I have done and it just helps me go back when I'm buying books or and you know what else is cool? Thrift stores. You'd be surprised at the. I have found I found a two hundred dollar herb book for two dollars at a thrift store in Oregon. So you just never know. So by having pictures of of those or creating a list of your you know your wish list that helps. But uh, you may have some questions, but I'm going to encourage you to let's wait till the end of today's uh, workshop for questions because we're we're going to try to move along so that we have time for you for all of your questions. Because the bottom line is we love to talk herbs. <laughs> let's get this part out of the way. Um, many of you probably already have perennial gardens, and uh, I'm going to jump down here and. Uh, look at like California poppies are beautiful and yeah sort of like we know that California poppies are medicinal but they really are they're an important nervine um, they're anti-spasmodic and they're also good for children's colic safe for children because it's all very mild um, you say that they're beautiful and uh, if you go Look at bee balm. My friend Kelly Ware, she's quite a she's a permaculture gar master gardener <laughs> extraordinaire. She has bee balm all throughout her yard, and I didn't realize until just a couple years ago that it is also medicinal. And because it's so common, um, it's good to know that if you have that, um, that it's good for common fevers. Um, it's good for the lung and the urinary tract. I I used this book as a reference guide on that, you'll see where it says Tilgner's. Jumping down to Comfrey. Oh, Comfrey is like one of my favorite. The whole plant is medicinal. I brought some leaf with me. It's good for so many things. It's good for lung, but also last year, Sandy Joe happened to be at my house and my neighbor called. His dog had cut his paw all the way down to the, just all the way through, and he couldn't afford to go to the vet. We pulled up fresh plantain and fresh comfrey and made a salve out of it. And uh, we added a little beeswax to it. It was nothing fancy, but he used that on his dog's pad. And he said three days later that had healed over and the dog did not need a bandage. And it was a pretty serious cut. Mm -hmm. So comfrey is good for that. Um, back when I homeschooled, my youngest child came in and we, had, we were beekeepers at the time. His head was literally covered with bees. And I had just purchased some uh, powdered comfrey root. Thank goodness that I had been introduced to herbs because I literally grabbed, you know how a mother is, you just grab it and before I knew it I was putting water in my hands and it was not pretty but I just packed his whole, uh, you know, everywhere I could put it, um, made a poultice. In less than a minute, he stopped crying. That's how quickly that worked to take the pain away. It did not take the, he got nauseous and he did vomit, but at least he took the pain away. It's just amazing. I have a whole bunch growing in that you guys can go get if you need starts. Uh, behind Crossroads 
Christian Fellowship in Big Park. I've got a garden out there, and it's, of course, a church garden, so you're welcome to take the start. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. It's prolific and very easy to grow. And it'll never go away from where you put it, so be careful where you put it. <laughs> <laughs> I put both the echinaceas going, moving down the line. I did put both of the echinaceas on here because for years I've always thought that um, the angustifolia was the best. Well, according to my research, why, it is, why the angustifolia is known to be better is because it lasts longer. But according to my research here, the reason why that's true is because it lasts longer, but the two, purpurea and angustifolia, are fairly interchangeable. Um, now, do you have anything you want to add to that? I would ask you guys because you you grow, you know, different types. Okay, then I don't grow. <coughs> do you? <laughs> Actually, we do, but I'm not sure which one it is. So I mean, but it's very effective. It is very. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I have found um, is that the root is the most commonly used, but um, I've also read that the whole plant can be used. Yeah. The flowers, mm -hmm. the everything. Yeah. The so the whole plant. The middle, the whole, the whole thing. So that's <coughs> something for you to research. <laughs> A little question and, and check follow up. Um, Okay, toward the bottom, right below lavender, I see that I have a little typo. Oh, I also spelled perennial wrong, sorry. <laughs> um, right at the end of the line on a lavender, you'll see where lemon balm is the next that I cover. Lemon balm is so easy to grow. It smells wonderful and it's beautiful. It is a perennial. Uh, many of you, if you uh, work with essential oils, you'll know it also as Melissa. That is good for insomnia, nervous digestion, anything to do with anxiety, and it also helps calm the bronchial system. Sage is another one. That's also good. I'm just going to touch, um, the, the last one is thyme. Thyme is a really important herb. And I'm, because we're limited on time, I'm, I'm just going to breeze through it. But make a note to yourself to read, to learn about time. Whether it's an essential oil or an herb, it's very important. So jumping down to the less commonly known, anise hyssop. It's super easy to grow. It's beautiful. It blooms like as soon as it starts blooming, it blooms until it, until the snow comes pretty much until it freezes. It's beautiful and it's so aromatic. It smells like licorice. And that is really important for, it helps relieve congestion. And because it's a nervine, it just, um, just settles everything down and, and it strengthens cardio. Um, going down, oh gosh, we've got horseradish is really easy to grow. In fact, horseradish, um, this is a fire cider tonic that I'm going to, um, in our box we have the recipe. Each one of you, you can leave with the recipe for fire cider if you would like. Um, well, if anybody's used uh, horseradish, you know that it clears the sinuses. <laughs> it definitely, <laughs> yesterday our house, I made this yesterday, our house was a sinus clearing event. <laughs> also a good plant to help distract the grasshoppers to go eat it and not the rest of your garden. Thank you. Very good to know. A lady stopped by our table and she said when she planted herbs that it helped keep the deer, they, they weren't so likely to eat. <laughs> yeah, that's good. One that uh, is important to, um, as you tap into our YouTube channel, you'll hear me refer to, or us refer to, a primary herb. A primary herb is one that you don't want to be without. One of them is uh, red clover. It's mildly spasmodic. It's an alterative. alterative. Um, it is used, it's a, also a blood cleansing herb. I, I'm not going to stand here and claim that but it is traditionally known in, in herbal medicine 
to be used in blood cleansing formulas. So I encourage you to learn more about red clover. And it's so easy to grow. Yeah, it, that's when you can also uh, find in the wild. The last one in the less commonly grown perennials is wormwood. It's a silvery green plant that also grows in the wild. It's very pungent and it's aromatic. Um, boy, learn about that one too. It's very, uh, very good for anti-parasitic. It's um, also known um, to be used with malaria. Uh, put that, make a note to yourself to learn more about that one too. <laughs> Let's go to the next section because I think I'm over time, aren't I? Oh dear. No, okay. You're, no, you're good. <laughs> okay. Uh, medicinal shrubs and trees. Look down the list on that. How would you have known that apple is as medicinal as it is? Um, apple is good for gallstones. It helps purify the blood. It also helps balance the body's pH level. Apricot is rich in iron and minerals and fiber. Uh, if you look there on, on the third line, cedar, SPP, that means there are many cedar species. The cedar tree that grows in our region is one of the most medicinal trees on the planet. The whole tree, whether it's the cedar tips, or the bark or the root, it's all very medicinal. Antifungal, antiviral, anti anything not good for you. Um, it's a primary herb, cedar tips, especially if you are out in the woods, um, you can gather enough for your family that year. Hops, um, any beer loving people, you'll agree, it's a good sedative, right? <laughs> good for anxiety, <laughs> no, it really is. Um, the nice thing too is, um, when you make a tincture or a tea out of it, it is, it is bitter, but it does help just calm the nerves um, for s like a sleep formula. Raspberry leaves are so important to help tonify a, a woman's womb throughout pregnancy or even before um, not pregnant. It just helps a woman's female organs. Um, it also helps ease child, the, the contractions. It helps. It's just good stuff. The peony, I, I, I apologize, there is more information about the peony. It's used in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, more information forthcoming on that in a YouTube video because it is important. But did you know? I mean, it's so beautiful, but it is. It's medicinal. So we'll cover that. <coughs> the next one I'm really excited about, um, the plum tree bark. So there's a... Um, there is a bark called Pygeum bark that comes from Africa and it's been grossly over harvested and not as readily available as it used to be. Well, in my research, it, because it's of the Prunus family, I did some research and found that the Italian purple plum bark is 98.5% identical to the Pygeum. And so I collected that last year and I have three clients using that um, with successful feedback. They're reporting back that it's very much helping their prostate. It's known to um, help the prostate gland. Vital. It's for men, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So I, your common Italian plum bark tree. <laughs> uh, let's go down to the medicinal sh uh, shrubs and trees that are less commonly known. Most of us here know about choke cherry and um, for years I've made syrup out of it, but it's also good for cough and bronchitis. Um, also the bark is what is used in, it's called Old Indian Cherry Bark Syrup by a company called Planetary Herbals. Mm -hmm. So the choke cherry bark is also good for cough. Of course elderberries, <laughs> elderberries are a primary ingredient, whether it's flowers or the berries for sure. There are two species that grow here wild. One is the black elderberry which grows mostly at higher elevations. Unless you're a master gardener like Kelly, she gets it to grow down <laughs> Polson. Or the blue elderberry. 
And our, our teacher, John <coughs> Tracy, down in Big Fork, says that the blue is working as well as the black, but um, what I've read consistently is you focus on the black if you can, the black elderberry. Oregon grapefruit, oh, before, mountain huckleberry. So bilberry is one, bilberries are good for eyes, but we can't always, you know, we're, we can go to the store and buy bil, bilberries, but huckleberries are as good for the eyes as bilberries. Also, the leaf of the huckleberry plant is known to balance and support the pancreas for blood sugar imbalances. Very important to know. The one thing about the huckleberry leaves is you want to get them early in the year before the bugs, they do get buggy. So you want to do that early in the season. Um, a little shout out to the Center for Native Plants. If you have a property that you're going to want to um, grow some of these uh, native shrubs, I would uh, shout out to the Center for Native Plants. They're up in Whitefish. They also have a table downstairs, and um, she and I had a good conversation about this. At the bottom, where you see the references, um, you'll see there are some websites down here that Linda Peterson in her book gives you for goji berries because goji berries are also really high antioxidants. So another reason to tap into her book. Jolene, Phoenix Tears Nursery for gojis. Who? Phoenix Tears Nursery. He found them growing along the tracks where the Chinese actually were building the railroad. Okay, so are they the here? Ones. They're down south. Okay. In Utah. Okay. But they'll ship them up. They're a great company for them. I will follow up with you on that and we'll include that in one of our YouTube I'll have to note to self on that. Well, that is um, just a touch on so much that you can do to grow your own uh, herbal medicine right there. But the next category is gathering. This is where we get all excited. So this time, <laughs> of, <laughs> this time of year, we are like so ready for winter to be over because we're ready to get out into the woods. There is... God's creation provides in all the flora, there are pheromones that naturally resonate with us as humans because we're part of the creation. That is why we feel so we're able to relax when we're out there. It's just, it's so healthy. So this time of year, <laughs> we're ready to get out and feel some pheromones. Um, but not only that, it's just where we have fellowship with each other and uh, where we learn. So we start the gathering section of today's workshop, and you guys brought some books, and you brought some books. Uh, so the, one of the number one questions is, is how do I know what I'm what to find, right? Okay, there are a number of few books with pictures for planet and identification guides. Yeah. First of all, you want to be able to identify the plant that you're looking at, and then you want to, you can like take your phone and take a picture of it, and then you can learn also, um, here is another, yeah, these are all good. Here is another one. Just a number of identification guides. <coughs> One of the reasons why we are doing, uh, going to be doing YouTube videos is we tapped into a, a resource that can transcribe our videos into print and our goal is to create a field guide. So when you're out in the woods and you see a yellow flower and you don't know what it is or a certain plant, the format of that book will allow you to identify what you're looking at on the same page, it'll um, sh tell you what it's good for medicine. And George, his input is going to help. Uh, you'll be able to identify the habitat that you're in, which will help you know where to go find that in the mountains. So we're pretty excited. It's just making gathering herbs more accessible to all of you. Um, it's, it's just mainly getting out there. Uh, George, do you mind sharing just a couple tips?
tidbits of wait, about um, ethics and habitat. This particular area has a complement of plants that are native there. I don't know if anybody in here knows anything about Bob Feaster, but he uh, classified uh, habitat types in northern Idaho, western Montana. Uh, primarily aspect, elevation, and rainfall determine what type of plant you have there. And in, in Bob's book, he has a section in the back where each particular habitat type has a least list of species typically found there. So that's, that's a pretty handy item. Uh, when you're going through your identification books, you'll take a look at that. It'll tell you whether it takes a dry site or a wet site. So let's say you're looking for balsam ariza. Well, you're not going to find balsam ariza on, on north facing slopes. No, you're going to find it mid elevation to low elevation on southerly exposures because it's typically a dry site, a lot of times associated with ponderosa pine. So just become familiar with with your association of plants and where you find them. And as far as gathering is concerned, <clears throat> I've talked to both the Forest Service and the state, and for small quantities, they said they consider a small quantity up to a gallon. Uh, you don't need a permit. But some of those uh, agencies have some restricted species, and those restricted species may change from year to year, so they'd recommend that you stop in at a local agency office and get their list of restricted species. Did you also um, mention about the state land use permit? Yeah, they, uh, the state land is just for being on state lands. You need what they call a recreation permit. And for hunters, when you buy your hunting license, you are buying your state recreation permit, but you can go in and buy a state recreation permit. And as far as uh, the quantity to gather from every particular colony or area, <coughs> it's recommended that you don't gather more than about 20% of that colony, just for perpetuation of the species. Thank you for sharing that and bringing that up. If you are on the reservation, the reservation lands are not, we're not supposed to gather on those, um, but there are, you can find private land and you can gather there. So now the fun part, the tools. <coughs> yeah. When I, when I first started gathering, I would go out with these guys and they had all kinds of stuff. And I broke my back the first time because I didn't have the right equipment. So take it away, you guys. We take a, uh, we use the shovel, certainly. We also have, we, have, we use a backpack. And that'll go with us when we go out on the trail or we go out harvesting. In it, <coughs> there are certain essentials. <coughs> Excuse me again. This is one of them. We're in bear country. And we always carry it. Put it on your belt so you can get to it quickly. You, we hope we never have to use it, but if we do, we better have it. Another essential. <laughs> What's that for? <laughs> well, I, if you don't have to ask, I can't tell you. <laughs> Another essential in our group is chocolates. Yay! <laughs> Marty's the chocolate guy. He always supports all the women with chocolate. <laughs> yes. I'm a person of some importance, obviously. <laughs> we also, uh, in here, will carry bags, paper bags for gathering herbs and plastic bags. You it's a good way to recycle loop. it. Yes, you yeah, can do you that. Can your loop and have three or four bags around when you're out you're picking stuff. Per and you put the Sandy separate Coe ones. Sandy Coe is really in. good at that. She's got them all around her. All around. <laughs> <laughs> but they're just hanging down. And if you get your, you know, you're picking other things, mm -hmm. you have a bag for them. You don't want to mix them up because when you get home, it's just a mess. Mm -hmm. oh. That's a <laughs> Also, when you're out and about, then you're learning and studying and all that, this is our camera bag. So when you find herbs, you can photograph them. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's really, really important is a logbook. Mm -hmm. When you're out and about, 
you can, uh, what we do is we, we, we write the day and where we are so you know the location. Then what we find, what condition it's in, what, if it's a blooming thing, we know that, and everything you can know. And this year after year will be a tremendous bottle and tool for you. Yes, every year is not exactly the same. It, and this year will be very it's, different. We're supposed to have a damp spring. A so cold when and, stuff yep. cold and damp. So when it starts coming, I mean, the, the plants will be just, they just will explode. They will. And they'll take care of everything that they need to do, the reproduction, the whole thing, in probably two weeks, mm -hmm. or maybe three weeks. But, I mean, they're just ready. They're just sitting there in the ground waiting to just come up and, and that's, I mean, and you have to know, and every year is a little bit different. And if you have a dry season, <coughs> you'll find herbs that normally would get really tall, they'll get that tall, and they'll bloom, and they'll do just what they need to reproduce. Mm -hmm. Now this year, with all the moisture out there, we expect them to be <laughs> and quickly yeah. and you can't you um, years like this year you really can't uh, compare it to a year three or four years ago because the situation is totally different so you have to go out there the only way to know what's going on is to be there and what we do um, in fact what I do I'm pretty famous for it because I love getting out is follow the snowpack up up the up elevation see where it is and as we can get into places then we go in there let's see what else we have here there are also you can use uh, there are maps of all types which will be handy you can uh, forest service maps there are many many different kinds of maps and there are topographical maps and we use them and it'll tell you what the terrain is where the old roads may be um, a lot of the uh, a lot of things have changed on topographicals because they may be 15 years old, but it will tell you a lot. And it's good to have a compass with you. If you go very far afield, then you want to have various survival items. You should always have a first aid kit. It can be a very simple one. The farther out you go, the more you need in the way of uh, survival items. So what else would we want to let's see? As far as tools, it's it's handy to have all kinds of things. Well, yes, this is in the pack all the time. Yeah. Always. Uh, you'll use this. But, well, you use it. As far as uh, beyond the shovel, we all have our favorite digging implements. Hand implements. This is my favorite. Especially if you're in rock, in rocky soil. Yes. And if you're in rocky soil, you can, well, we have trowels and things like that. You can also use something like this in rocky soil. <coughs> Another thing, not right now exactly, but later on when, uh, when things are green and the insects are out, you can make your own insect repellent to take with you. And there are lots of different natural ones you can make. A knife. There's always a knife in the pack. There's some tools you're going to use religiously. There's another thing we keep in there, just in case there are any bee stings or bug bites, we keep um, better drill. Mm -hmm. So, probably. Just leave this for show and tell us sure. here, I think. Yeah, and, and then, one, one thing that comes to me is each year um, going out with you guys, mm -hmm. I have, my toolkit has grown um, because your needs will grow as you develop your knowledge of herbs and expand your collection. Um, you will just develop a more sophisticated toolkit or more thorough functional. Um, I remember that first year I didn't have uh, insect spray. Thank you, Sandy Joe. <laughs> and here I use actually uh, went off of her 
her recipe and you're welcome to take a picture of what I included it's mainly essential oils but you're welcome to take I I really want to emphasize I do not hoard my recipes and formulas the more people that know how to uh, make uh, your own medicine the better we all are so please feel free to do that we all help one another yes yeah. yes and the more we all know the better we all are another thing with tools is you'll find yourself making your own one thing we use you can get um, plastic or some kind of um, where you get protein mix and that sort of thing containers poke holes in each side put a string through it and you put it over like this and if you're collecting berries up like this mm -hmm. like so you'll you'll you, as you go along you'll get more sophisticated you'll find things that works really well for you and may be totally different from someone else but not there are also if you're getting berries yeah. that are over way but down there you can see them but if you go look just another six inches you're you're going to be down six feet we have a thing with a little hook or a nail on the end so you can pull the and we can also do that as as, as teams too. teams yeah one, one person can pull it, it in and the other one can do the picking so there, there are so many things and the, the thing of it is it's great fun it's also hard work yeah there, it is hard work. It's harvesting, that's the great fun. Processing, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. There's some fun in it, but it's really work. It's so worth it, it. It's worth it. But it is. It's great, like I say, it's great fun, but if you don't want to work, um, there is work involved, no question about that. This is just kind of to the aside, but um, if you're digging roots, you, you don't want to waste any time processing them. I mean, you get them home, wash them, cut them up, or you're just going to end up with a bunch of little rocks that you can't use. Once they dry. So, yeah, so that, that's just a little something I thought of. <laughs> but you can talk to any of us, uh, you know, about our experiences and all. We, we're, we're all, we're here to help. And also, because we're all, we, we all know what we do together, uh, it might be the middle of the winter and somebody needs something. You know? right. Do you have any lamation? You know, compound or made up, or do you have this or do you have that? Somebody has it, and we all, you know, share. That reminds me, Jolene, I need some of the plum bark. <laughs> <laughs> we'll trade you that for some OSHA root. Okay. Yeah. All right, deal. we're on. Deal. It's, a, it's a deal. Marty is our faithful scout. He goes out about every two weeks, and that's one thing you please make a note in your gathering section. The succession of plants is about every two weeks. So you'll find a, a whole new uh, species of plants coming up about every two weeks. So that's a, just getting out in the woods um, every couple weeks and you'll find new species <coughs> and that's a, a good way. And you do have to be out there. Yeah. And it, when, it, when it ripens at all, will we'll vary year to year mm -hmm. and condition to condition. But this is a different year. Okay. So, so we'll, we'll be out early and we'll see. You come up and look at any of this stuff. Yes, absolutely. The first species that we'll gather are the cottonwood buds. Just to make a little note, um, toward the end of March. Um, oh, it smells divine. Then you put that in olive oil, and that's good for the, the skin. Yeah, that's good. It's good for baby bottom sap, things like that. Yeah, yeah. So that's when we really launch. Okay, the next section is uh, processing herbs. So. When we're out in the woods, uh, we bring it home, then what do we do with it? Well, this is my herb gathering basket, one of them. And then, so when we come home and we cut it, we clean it, whether it's, if it's roots, oftentimes you have those clippers, the, the clippers that they have in their gathering pack. I use the same clippers to go ahead and uh, cut up the herbs after or you can just use scissors, depending. Then once I do cut those up, then I put them on, uh, the herbs or the roots on screen. <coughs> if you have a dehydrator, you can use that as well. Um, Connie, why don't you mention your creative way of... Well, I live in a little dinky house, so I have to utilize the space that I have. So one thing that I did is I hung a 
four chains from the ceiling, and then I can put my screens in layers, which can be a good way to get what you got to get done and utilize the space that you have. Uh, in 2013, when I began gathering with uh, my friends here, I, George and I were living in a wall tent uh, as we began building our house. So I had <coughs> herbs hanging from strings, and it's if you, you know, like the age-old saying, if you're interested enough, you'll find a way to make it happen. It's true. These are just tools that I use, um, just kind of randomly gathered. I'll pass this around. These are herbs that we have gathered or we have grown, but you're welcome to just, if you want to, or you can just go see us at our table because we have these down for you to look at also. These are some other tools I use. Um, when you're, uh, let's go to the next page. I'm jumping ahead. So making your own herbals, that's the number one question that we're asked and that is, well, once I do get the herbs or uh, gather them, what do I do with it? Well, first you, you want to clean it and uh, as you learn in your books, you can learn that there are some herbs that it's best to make your tinctures as fresh herbs or if you dry them. This right here is one of the best tools that Sandy Joe taught me last year. After you clean your herbs, whether they're roots or um, the leaf, you put it in here and the salad spinner saves your hands. Your, you know, like your wrists start aching after you do so much of it. But salad spinner, colanders of varying degrees are another thing. Um, this right here, Walmart carries the best, finest strainer that I have found. So um, because we're limited in time today, we're not going to be able to get into the details of like actually how to make a tincture and that type of thing. So, so what I did was I found an easy recipe that I could show you that you can go home today and make. All the ingredients, for, most of the ingredients from this came from the grocery store. Ginger root, horseradish root, green peppers, jalapeno peppers, um, whole cloves, onion, and then I just, I put all that in there. And then it, garlic, yes. Chopped it all up, put it in here, and then filled it with raw apple cider vinegar, and you wanna make sure it's the raw. Then what I did was I put in um, powdered turmeric, cut and sifted dried rosemary, and I put in dried pine tips that I had gathered last year. The pine tips are very high in vitamin C also, but I like the flavor. So this is something we want to share the recipe with you so that you can go home and even though this isn't what, you know, a specific herb as we would think of it, this is herbal medicine right here. And I'll tell you, this has kept us, we, we take our vitamin C, we take our herbs, but this right here has kept our household from getting the flu. Just It's just been just that little edge keeping us above. How long can you keep it in the jar like that? So once you chop it up and mix it together, I did this yesterday, I will, I will do this once or twice a day for a minimum of four weeks. Okay. And then you strain it. And I'm going to show you what I do. These are stained yellow because of the turmeric. What I do is I, I lay out the cheesecloth. It, it's too narrow to just use one piece, so I just crisscross it in the, the colander like that. And then I have it, you know, inside of a bigger bowl, which I didn't bring today. But then I just dump all the you know, all that in there. And then I gently just gather this up. And with both hands, I just gently start squeezing all the juice out. Now, some people use the, 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 
the actual ingredients for making barbecue sauce or uh, marinating meat, you can do that or you can put it in your garden. But then you take the strained juice and that's your fire cider. Some people like to just mix that with olive oil for vinaigrette, that's an option. Or you can take probably one cup or so honey to taste and then you mix that in there and then the hunt, raw honey just adds to the, the medicinal value, but it also makes it a little more palpable. <laughs> so then this, this winter, George and I have just taken a little shot glass, put it into a glass and add a little, about a quarter to a half a cup of water and just drink that a couple times a day and it just soothes the digestive system, but it just, when I'm feeling seedy, I, I take this in addition to my vitamin C and my, my wellness formula. So this right here you can you can do today. Do you wear gloves when you squeeze out your cheese cloth? <laughs> it all depends. With this I, I don't, and it hasn't been an issue because of the cayenne pepper. That's a good question. Um, it, it hasn't affected me, no, but that's a good point. What about the staining? Poly gloves. Oh yeah, that's part of being a nervous. <laughs> but if you don't want the staining, you can put the, the disposable gloves on. That's a good point. So processing herbs, where, where are my notes? Am I covering everything? Like I said, because we're short on time today, um, that's all I'm gonna cover. So let's, we have a few minutes. If anybody has any questions for any. What about telling you about the um, mushroom? Oh, yeah. yeah. Take a look in your <laughs> section on making your own herbals. If you go down the line, it, you'll see where um, you can, one of the ways that you can make your herbal medicine, um, some people prefer not to have the alcohol base, so they make glycerin tincture or glycerides. And I know Sandy and Marty do, and Connie is the master in our group of making glycerides. Well, I've been doing this quite a few years. Um, spring, summer, and fall is our harvesting season, and in the winter, I utilize that time to come up with my own recipes. So it's kind of fun. Um, you do your research, of course, and then you can kind of just use your imagination. Um, I've come up with a, with a process to do glycerins which are very kid friendly and elderly friendly. Um, glycerin is kind of a thick um, honey type of substance. It's sweet. So because of that, the tinctures are more palatable, um, which are real good for children. They're real child friendly. I also make um, infused honeys. Um, the process on each thing is a little different. Um, glycerins you have to apply heat to. Um, with alcohol tinctures, the alcohol, um, retracts the medicine from the plants with glycerins you have to use a heating process um, anybody that's interested in that I would be happy to share what I know um, I've got a little um, I brought a notebook if you guys would like to um, put your name and phone numbers on there I'm kind of computer illiterate <laughs> these folks are helping me with that we're, we're gonna try to do some YouTube videos but I personally am not very good at that kind of stuff so um, put your phone numbers down um, if you're interested and I will be happy to get in touch with you and try to set up a workshop to show you how to do that process. That, that concludes the uh, official aspect of our workshop, Does, but please ask questions. Let, let's talk herbs. Do you guys ever do like home uh, teaching classes, like where you take people out to the field to identify stuff? You, you asked about um, us having like field classes actually yeah. going out and gathering. Our hearts want to do that, but the, these last two years logistically with all of our, each one of us has had a major life event happen that precluded us from organizing that, and so that is why we're launching the YouTube channel. Do you to know do that. Of any, um, groups that do that? Uh, Tom Tracy, the herbalist in Big Fork, he begins doing that early in June. And he is most, all of our, t he is really our, our main teacher. Okay. Swan Valley Herbs. Mondays and Thursdays. 837-5747. I work there. Yeah, Sandy Joe still works there. Yeah. Yes? 
Do you know what your YouTube channel will be called, or is there a way to follow up so that we can get to the well, right now, the YouTube channel that is already um, put together is called Earth Garden Living. And um, the, the hope is that we can also include, I mean, George Barks has 50 years uh, doing his wildlife biology and forestry in our local mountains. And so if we're out doing a wildcrafting class or gathering, and he is able to teach us um, we'll include those in separate videos. So we're trying to find a name that is kind of generic that that fills this too. But that may change. But if it does, we'll communicate that. Yeah. Do you have any tips or tricks for uh, cleaning birds and draft light before drying them? That kind of thing. I ran into it takes me a long time to take very slow baths. <laughs> I was wondering if there's any things you tend to do that helps. You know, Besides the tips and tricks. Tips and tricks on cleaning herbs and roots. Most of the time, all we do is just rinse them off. But that will fall off in the drying process if you're going to dry them. And as long as you rinse them well, it's still going to be good enough. In the same way with the leaves. For one thing, you want to make sure you're gathering where they haven't been sprayed. And then the next thing is you're just rinsing the dust off of them. And that's where the salad spinner comes in. It gets all the water off of the leaves so they'll dry better or won't add so much water to your tincture when you make it. Otherwise, you don't need to go to great big lengths. Uh, Tom Tracy, I asked him that question early on. And he smiled at the sparkle and winked and he said, a little bit of dirt is part of the medicine. <laughs> a little bit, not much, but um, that, that's what I would um, like. One of the suggestions too, especially on, uh, well with any of it, is you do want to clean it and process it as soon as possible. I've had roots dry on me because I couldn't get to it, and luckily my husband has a chop saw. <laughs> but you don't want to have to do that. Can we speak up a class that you're promoting? Um, on their, uh, I will create a YouTube video on an event that will be coming up in May. I'll be teaching a workshop at the Purple Frog Gardens, and uh, soon we'll be putting the information on that together. But and thank you. Yeah. So Where will you advertise that in? All over. Yeah. You'll you'll Facebook. Yeah. Sure, it'll Facebook be posters. Website.